Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the May 2023 general meeting of the Minnesota Astronomical Society. Let me grab my notes out of the way here. Um, I am your current president for the next two years, Trina Johnson, and it's my pleasure to entertain you this evening for at least a little bit. Okay, maybe not. That's not in, not that's not on the volunteer sheet. Um, but I do want to point out that we have a sunny day today. But it's because we took solar pictures from Chris Setness that you see on your screen, and we brought sun from Texas back. It took a little while to get here, but you know, okay. It's a joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for laughing. I appreciate that. So there is our your current board, me for president. John Zimich is here in the house for VP. Dave Faulkner is out of here tonight. He is celebrating his birthday. So happy birthday, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. We have Matt, who is on controls tonight, and your treasurer. Conrad's here in the house, too, along with Ahmed. So Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. And welcome new members. We have, I forget, forgot to count, um, but we have several new members along with some returning members. Do we have any members here in the house tonight? Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Team, you're not a new member. I said new. Oh, well, then everybody should raise their hands. We. <laughs> we are very happy that you are here tonight and hopefully we'll have some good information to share with you. Um, if not, stop by, ask us questions, um, ask the longtime members some questions. And in the back of the room, if you would like a name badge, which I forgot mine tonight, there's a form to fill out and um, we'll get you a little name badge. If you have any questions about that, Chris Setness is over here um, to ask them of you. Is there an online form for that too? Okay. All right. Cool. Where is that found? On the MAS forums? Okay. A sticky up there. Okay. Okay. All right. If anybody has any questions about that, come see us later. Oh, I grabbed pictures from the Astrophotography Slack channel um, to do as little slide deck shows. So if anybody is interested in sending, giving me some for on the slide deck for any kind of meeting time, send them to the president or info um, at MN Astro, and I will be glad to use them. But for now, we are on to, Chris provided a lot of pictures for me this time. Thank you, Chris. We have the Lonerscope program, which John, if you want to come up here, which Matt should have been up here too. Um, and talk about, because I know Anton is out tonight. So, yes. Give us the rundown. Anton isn't available, if anybody's aware. Um, but Anton is running our loaner scope program. So when you go onto the website and you go into loaner scopes and you fill out a reservation form, that's who's actually responding and he completes your request. Now, uh, Right now, especially for the new people, uh, we do, we have um, 16 telescopes that you can check out uh, in, in the Loner Scope program. And the, this is just an example of some of them. We have multiples. The most popular are up there on the upper left, uh, the C8 and the 8-inch Dove. Those are our most popular. That, that's where you'll probably get on a waiting list if you put your name in for one. So if you're looking for one, uh, get in early so you can get your name on the list and you can make sure you have it for the observing season. And we also have, not thank you, Trina. We have 19 uh, courses on a DVD that are available. You can check those out and watch those as well. And we use that uh, just 30 days and that uh, you're on this for. And if no one else is reserving a scope for one of these DVDs, you can keep it another 30 days, after which we like it then to turn it in just so we can keep track of things. So uh, Anton will be um, unavailable from the 11th to the 23rd 
of May. So if you have any requests for things he, he is asking, and if, if you go on the MAS site under the loaner telescopes, you'll see that uh, there's a message up there from Anton asking, if you have any requests, get them in by the 10th of May so he can fulfill those and you can get them picked up. And then after the 23rd, he'll be back and not running operations normal. Are there any questions on the Loaner Scope program? How many people in house have used a loaner or checked out a loaner scope? Cool. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We'll just make it a round ten number. <laughs> I have two. That's how I started in, on in the club. Is I borrowed a couple of telescopes to figure out what I wanted to use and see, and it kind of pointed me in the right direction. So if you, as new members, if you are anywhere interested or need some help with it. This is the best play, best time to actually borrow one without expending a bunch of money at this point. But go ahead and spend money. We love having people have telescopes. It's okay. Thank you, John. To the events before next meeting. Well, tonight is a full moon, so I expect everybody to be outside just enjoying the moon and doing your Lunar 1, Lunar 2 for the Astronomical League, if you can. Um, but there's also the Eta Aquarius meteor shower, um, which might get blasted out a little bit because of the new, of the full moon, but you might still be able to see something. It depends. Um, so let's see. What else we got? That's about it. About it. Oh, and the ly Lyrid? Lyrid? Lyrid meteor shower. That one would be better. That one's on new moon night. Sure. Um, yep. Uh, my son said on his he had a calendar that said on May 17th that there was a, um, what is it called? Uh, Occultation? Jupiter uh, going back to a project. Can you repeat that? Um, there's a person, uh, a guest in house that is asking about, I think you said the 17th, about an occultation or conjunction of Jupiter and the moon. Yeah. Okay. So there is a, there is an occultation of Jupiter by the moon on the morning of the 17th. But the problem is, is that the sun will be up. So you're not going to see Jupiter very well, you know, and the moon is going to be just, I mean, it's just a sliver. I mean, because you have up there, a new moon is on the 19th. So, I mean, even visually, it it's going to be hard to challenge. see. And I think when I looked at it on um, um, Sky Safari, even though it's 25 degrees away from the sun, mm -hmm. that's still too close. I mean, it's just going to be. Okay. So to answer your uh, question, you probably again, do it with it a is. telescope. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a little bit harder. Yeah, I don't have time, times on this. I mean, the, the atlas that I use, uh, thanks to Mark, has some information about it and some times, but it, there's a lot more on there. So if you have any, I think I have a little link at the bottom. If you want to go to the astropixels.com al almanac, it has a full listing of everything for May that's happening, including that occultation and conjunction on there, along with a couple of other things. So. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. We do have some upcoming star parties. Um, so they're on the on the 13th and the 27th. Um, there is always a request for key holders to volunteer for each star party. And I believe there is also the first of the key holder training that is going on for that that particular day. So you can you know get part of your key holder training done and then stay that evening and help out and assist um, and learn learn how to use your information that you newly was were trained on. So that's that's a positive. And then toward the end of the month is is the um, second part of that. So there's always two two star parties held for at ELO for public. So anybody can come and visit there. Um, and <laughs> I'm still nervous and new at this, Steve. Um, but then, of course, May May 12th in Cedar Creek, we have another one of one of our um, public star parties for them, and it's it's fairly small, fairly 
quiet, not a whole lot of people as far as public come, um, but it's it's becoming a little bit bigger we'll, over the, yes. Do we have some structure or directions to your Greek on the website? I believe we do. Do we vault? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's just up in um, East Bethel. Thank you. Thank you. I knew it was up, up Highway 65, then you know, about a mile and a half in on toward the east. So, um, and then of course, the BSIG, which I will get to. So you'll, you'll be up in a couple of slides. Um, the CGO is having their, well, hopefully we'll have their Virgo venture um, on May 19th, which is a Friday night with the backup on the 20th. Uh, along with LLCC always having its star party weekends. And I believe JJC is also having a keyholder training on May 6th, this Saturday, which might conflict with some people with the Rebecca's um, event here, which is my next slide, which is the new member orientation. So all of the new members that were here, I think our last one was November. So anybody who's joined from November, December through now, or interested in joining, please come to the Roseville Library on Saturday to the public com or the common room. I believe it is, and and Steve and Rebecca will be hosting all the all the wonderful benefits that the MAS um, has around for you. So, is there any questions about that? Yes. No, it's actually just down the street. So from here, it's about about four miles down the road. I can I can help give you directions a little bit after the presentation here. Hamlin and Mead. Yep. Okay. Yep. In Roseville. In Roseville. Yeah. It's it's just like two blocks south of Highway 36. It's, it's good. It's very easy to find. So thank you. I'm I'm hoping to join you guys. And then we have the following weekend. So Rush wants to talk about his BSIG coming up. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, we had to reschedule the last BSIG. It was April 29th, but as most people know, it was cloudy. It's been cloudy all spring. So uh, we're hoping to have another chance again on the 13th. Um, we'll start up about 7 o'clock. So if you're interested in coming, uh, drop me an email. I'm on the forum uh, so I can let you know in case of a weather cancellation or something like that. But uh, we're always looking for volunteers as well. So if you'd like to help out, uh, with our beginners, uh, feel free to let me know and we'll set it up. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Suresh. Lots of fun. Hopefully it will be a good weather. <laughs> We're getting there. I, th I think Mother Nature is finally figuring out that it's supposed to be spring and summer. We do have a couple of other public service announcements, which I'm bringing in. So they have a uh, solstice party, summer solstice party. Um, on the Saturday. And I, I think they've had it for like two or three years and they were just wanting to kind of extend it into the night a little bit. So uh, I'm looking for volunteers, maybe up to five to bring some scopes out. It's a pretty nice site. It's less than an hour away. It's about a, oh, a bottle four or so. So it'd be similar to ELO darkness. Oh, cool. um, they have as many as 2000 people during the daytime, but they said at night, they had used to have like a bonfire and they had about 50 people stay. So we're estimating maybe between 50 and 100. So um, it's, uh, and also you, if you want to come out and do it, just give me a, send me your info and my email, and I'll send you further information on that. Huh? That's a Saturday. Yes. Um, <clears throat> it is a new moon weekend, so the imagers may or may not be there, but uh, <laughs> if you guys are, are on the north east side of the St. Paul area, it'd be a good opportunity to drive out. So it's about 40 miles from here. So how close is that to Taylor's Falls? Close within 20. Interstate Park is like five miles away, 10 miles okay. away. Okay. So not, uh, not bad. So they have a, like, it's a, uh, the park itself is a sculpture park and they have about 60 installations. So it's pretty fun just to go out and take a look at that if you want to come early. So thank you. So if anybody wanted to attend the event during the day, is there a cost for that or is that free? It's free. I think charge $10 parking. Okay, free but $10 parking. Okay. Perfect. That'll be great. Thank you, Clayton. I appreciate that. Um, and then, of course, did you, Ahmed, did you want to talk about this? 
Okay. Well, Ahmed's walking up here. I'll just touch base on the last one. The ELO committee is having a request for um, a new member to even um, even up their, their group. So if anybody's interested, do um, send an email to the MAS board at Emma Astro or own an info, or if you know Merle's email address, um, send him your interested information. Thank you, Trina. So I'll talk about the astrophotography. So pretty much in, you know, when COVID hit in 2020, and we're trying to figure out how can we bring back monthly meetings and we started, hey, let's actually have members share their uh, pictures and it picked up and everybody enjoyed it. And we've done it for the past three years. And this year also, we're gonna do it this summer, except I wanna give people a heads up. Hey, send me your pictures and you know, you can send me more than two, but I'll try to pick at least you know, a maximum of two per person so that we can share as many of the member pictures as possible. And here's the thing, you know, many times a picture doesn't need to be a success but there is a story behind it and set up. And I won't forget last year, like vaults, you were trying to image a galaxy cluster, right? It was not a success, but the intriguing story behind what he did in the technique was actually way more important than the picture itself. You know, it, you know, it, all of it matters, not just the picture, the setup, everything, send me what you have. Hopefully by the August meeting, you know, you have plenty of time. If you haven't started on a project, you can actually start on a project and finish it by then. Send it to me. And I'll be posting on Slack and on uh, on the forum, um, you know, reminders and stuff like that. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just notate the DSLR cameras, cell phone cameras, the astrophotography, every, everything counts toward this. If you find it interesting, you find it good, send it in. <laughs> I have some really cool cloud thunderstorm pictures. I know Chris does too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. We won't jinx it. Suresh or Ahmed, you might want to stay up here unless Vault wants to talk about it. The last section? I did the ELO while Ahmed was coming up here. It's okay. It's okay. It's just announcing it. There's also um, a forum post about the ELO committee um, as well take a peek at that so i just wanted to provide an update on the site reservation calendar vaults and i we've been working on it with the help from others chris and uh and steve bransky we fought we did the training last week and we started the pilot sorry last month and we started the pilot last month but then we came across a bunch of bugs with the way the calendar worked we ended up actually revisiting our entire design refreshed it significantly and right now uh, we have sort of like a testing session scheduled for Monday of next week. We're hoping that after that, we can actually roll out the updated calendar. So stay tuned. There will be communication coming out. In the meantime, we're also extending the pilot for about a month to compensate for the month that we lost. So please be patient with us. Hopefully soon here, we'll have a reservation calendar. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send them my way. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Right now, it it is running, but it's broken, so don't use it. When I well, yeah, when it's running, we're gonna have a, a two month duration where it's where we want people to use the old system of like posting stuff on the form and using it. But then after that, it's gonna be mandatory, and you can't post on the form to say I'm reserving this or reserving that. So, any other questions? That's a good one, Suresh. Thank you. Okay, again, if you have any questions, send me an email. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Ahmed. I appreciate that. Like you said, and if there are any questions, you can always email us and we'll make sure to answer them um, or get in touch with vaults. And just a quick little notation on the bottom. We have 100 and roughly 164 days to the annular eclipse in October and 341 days to the total solar eclipse that comes across the America. So start getting ready. Gemini articles. We are actually having our Gemini article or Gemini come out June 1st. So yeah. So if you have any article, if you yeah, if you have any articles or please submit it to Father Brown. May not make it in this one, but hopefully it'll make it in one of the previous ones or follow-up ones. Um, he's always looking for them. So just a little little PSA for him. Along with the um, happenings, and keep sending them to Dave Faulkner, who's our secretary. Um, and we're, we're, it's kind of a hit for this. It kind of started out as something kind of 
a trial basis, but I think it's actually worked out pretty well. And it's reminded people of some little tidbits along the way, reminders along the way, um, just kind of keeping it fresh in everybody's mind what's maybe coming up for the next one. So if you have things that you would like to announce even weeks after that or you know, further into the future, we can schedule those in as well. So just send it to Secretary at Astro, and we will um, be able to get it all set up and put in. So thank you. Yeah, Astronomical League Awards. Jerry is not here yet. He was here last month, but I still had the pleasure of announcing none. But this time, I do get to announce, and before I do, just a little, little quick tidbit about the Astronomical League Awards for the new members that are here and or online, we're listening to this recording later, that the Astro League Awards are observing lists that help prompt you as to what you want to search for next. If you're kind of struggling to find what area you want to go to, you know, anything along that line, they kind of give you an area to focus on, um, which I found helpful because that's kind of how I started the Messier list to get that. And it comes, and once you get um, items completed, you get a pin and you get a certificate. And it's, and it's really kind of cool to hang it around with a lanyard, which I'm hoping we'll have lanyards for sale at some point back in here because I think a few of us need some new ones <laughs> or more. <laughs> Though, um, so if you have if you have any questions about it, it's I believe alastroleague.org, um, and it'll tell you all about it. So now I get to announce our newest award, John Simich, who completed his Galileo project. So if you wouldn't mind coming up here and sharing information about it, so yay! Yes, I. Just completed the Galileo uh, project. And if any of you are interested in these awards, it, it only took me about 40 years uh, to get to actually be, be a member of Minnesota Astronomical Society. I was actually aware of it when it started in 72. That's when I built my first telescope. And I remember seeing the advertisement, but uh, I was out of state and came back and, uh, and uh, but I, I joined Minnesota Astronomical Society about 10 years ago. And then uh, I saw these awards. It's a great opportunity to expand. I was, I've been looking at observing for a long time. Uh, this is a very, very interesting project. And what, if you're not familiar with the Galileo uh, project that uh, Astronomical League puts together, it's duplicating the observations that Galileo made um, looking through, not really, we can't really duplicate the equipment because you wouldn't want one of those telescopes. Uh, his optics were excellent, but they were very small, but you're limited in power. So it's all low power, you know, 20 power. Um, there's, I did, I actually completed the binocular, uh, award for it. You can either use a low power telescope or a binocular. And mm -hmm. I chose to go the binocular route. And uh, you see, you're, and it takes a while because you're looking that you have to look at these specific objects that Galileo looked at, and there, throughout the year, it takes a whole year pretty much to to see all those. And and also, what takes long, and you're you're tracking the phases of Venus, and you know, so you're you have to be looking at that for a few months. You know, so so it it's a it's spread out over. A, a long period of time. And if you're considering doing the Galileo project, or if you're working on the solar system, there's a lot of duplication that goes on. Those two awards are similar. For example, Venus is a perfect example. Uh, the solar system award requires many more observations of Venus. But if you were gonna view Venus through your telescope at say 100 power or something, it's not gonna count toward Galileo. So you might as well grab pair of binoculars or put a low power eyepiece in there at the same time or use that observation and now you knock out both of those. So that would be my advice on that and then see what things match up and knock out both at the same time. But uh, any questions? Yes. Yes. Galileo did do sunspots. Now he didn't look through. He, I don't know how uh, 
long it took him to figure out that you don't look at the sun, but he, he was, he very quickly, him and his uh, assistants used eyepiece projection. And the eyepiece projection actually worked very well because they could easily sketch the eyepiece or the, the sketch the view because it's projected. They put a piece of paper there and you draw it. It's all very accurate. So it makes perfect sense that that's what they would do. But I'm sure someone figured that out. But I, I think they were smart enough to know that, hey, if I, I'm looking at the sun and, and I can't stare at the sun, I'm not going to point this thing at the sun. You know? <laughs> and then look in there because they're probably lighting stuff on fire behind it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, it does include sunspots. Yeah, I think that at some point they would figure out how to put a solar filter on their telescopes. Yeah, I think that would be much later. <laughs> Wow. Okay. All right. And what does the pin look like? I know you tried it. You showed uh, me a little bit last the night. Pin, so. it, 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 it's round. Well, yeah. No, the, not all of them are round. That's some true. Some are square, some that's are true. oval. So it's a round pin. It's mostly black. Uh, there's a, a gold telescope on there uh, uh, modeled after Galileo's telescope. And then there's a couple of the constellations. I, I, I think, I'm not positive on this. But I think uh, maybe Presepi and the Orion, uh, those are two of the star clusters that he observed, and you're supposed to observe those. The specs on his? Aperture, aperture that Galileo used was about an inch. And uh, they were about four feet long, four to six feet long. Uh, the initial telescopes were just under 20 power. I think he maxed out about 25. And that's why that that's the power range that you're limited to, because that's what he was doing. He he had um, access to very good glass in Italy. Uh, he didn't actually invent the telescope. The telescope was invented by I think a Danish guy. I can't. Yeah, and um, Galileo just invented or used and and perfected it for astronomical observing. He he saw that use for it. And he was an excellent, excellent optician. His, ex, his optics, he had real good glass and he knew how to use it. And none of the telescopes that the inventor put together were anywhere near what Galileo could produce. In fact, immediately the navies of the world were going to Galileo to make their telescopes because they could actually see stuff, <laughs> you know, not just blurry images. Awesome, awesome. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations. I appreciate that. Hopefully we will have more next month with the nicer weather that we're having and be able to complete a few more things. Um, so as Jerry says, that's his phrase, get out there and observe. And we would normally have a better NOAA constellation, but I thought we would run a little long, so I didn't do one for this month. So I'm looking for a volunteer for June um, to come up here and take our 15, 20 minutes and do a constellation or something else. I mean, I think we had um, a couple of variations on this theme. Um, just whatever would be interesting to you or to anybody else, that would be great. Just give, give us a shout and we'll um, get that set up. So thank you. And that's actually all I have for tonight, um, except for the next meeting is going to be here at the Onbetu Teka Education Center. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Don't quote me. Um, where we will have Professor Frank Kutzler from the Tennessee Technological in in University talking about st stellar nuclear synthesis. Really hard for me to say. <laughs> yeah, it's a hot topic. Um, but if you give us a few minutes, if you want to take a quick break, we're going to set up for our current speaker that will be coming online with uh, Professor Stephen Spangler from the University of Iowa. All right. Any questions? Okay. So I guess, can you hear me and see me? We can. It is. Okay. Awesome. Well, I guess see Seeing me isn't the um, isn't the big issue, but it is good if you can uh, see the screen. So, Ahmed, are you there? Yes, Ahmed's here. He's in the back of the room waving. Okay. To you. Well, say uh, hello, Ahmed. Um, 
your sister's doing a great job in running our club, which I'll mention here in a moment. So, uh, <laughs> perfect. The Rada family is doing a great service to astronomy in the Midwest. So, <clears throat> wonderful, wonderful. So, are, you, are you ready for me to start? We are. Go ahead. Okay, great. So, at any rate, the title of my talk tonight is uh, Venus, the Earth's Twin. And the question mark after it is uh, is very important, as you'll see. And uh, when I give astronomy talks to mainly my own club, but some other ones as well, uh, I always really like to have a case where I can talk about some object that you can actually see in the sky. Our, my own astronomy club uh, has public nights associated with a talk and then uh, observing afterwards. And so it's really great if we're going to have a talk on some astronomical topic and then go out and, um, and observe that object. And so this picture that you're seeing right now, as some of you may recognize, that's an astronomy picture of the day picture. It's appeared a couple times, but is a conjunction of Venus and Jupiter that I think occurred in 2012. And we had one very similar to that a few months ago. You won't see that now because Jupiter is, I think, a morning object by now, or it's in conjunction. But Venus is dominating the night sky. So I gave this talk at uh, my own uh, astronomy club, the Cedar Amateur Astronomers, uh, a couple of months ago when it was in the sky, but now it is really dominating the sky. So as I think everyone in this club will be aware, as soon as it gets dark, if you go out and look, you can see Venus and, and everybody can uh, notice that. So this is an ideal time of the year uh, to be talking about talking about and thinking about Venus, what we know, and what the future of studies of uh, Venus will be. Okay, so I've got a couple of introductory um, uh, comments to make. Uh, the first is Ahmed asked me to talk a little bit about the Cedar Amateur Astronomers, which is the um, astronomy club that I'm associated with and have been for many years. I joined them when I was still teaching at the University of Iowa. I uh, taught up for, for 39 years, up to two years ago. And a main part of teaching my astronomy classes was the field trip where I'd pack them in school buses and take them out to the observatory of the Cedar Amateur Astronomers. And I was really grateful for all the help. And also I figured I wanna have access to this uh, as well. So the Cedar Amateur Astronomers were founded in 1979. We currently have 141 members, and those include family memberships. That's one of the options we have. So the number of people who have some affiliation with our uh, club is uh, very large. Uh, the president is Noah Reda, Ahmed's sister, who's doing a superb job of uh, running the organization and has uh, uh, lots of ideas and so on. And her daughter Miriam is often there to, um, for instance, provide me with uh, pronunciations of Arabic, which is very helpful in uh, knowing about star names. So the, um, the center of our club, or the clubhouse, if you will, is the Eastern Iowa Observatory and Learning Center, which is uh, indicated here in this picture. This is um, a picture of it during the daytime. We have a, <clears throat> an annual solar Saturday in August where we have people come out and uh, we can observe the sun with Coronado telescopes and white light filters in the hole. But this shows the facilities we have. The uh, facility, the Eastern Iowa Observatory and Learning Center, is located in a county preserve. So this is the trees around it. The Cedar River is not far away. So it's a nature preserve. And these are the buildings we have. There is a large dome there, which is connected to the main building, which possesses a 24 uh, inch Cassegrain telescope, which was once used for research purposes at the University of Iowa. There's an adjacent dome, which is right there, which is um, an automated telescope is put in there. There is this dome here, which is contains a 16 inch Celestron telescope. And finally, my favorite, there's a roll off shed with a six inch refractor, which is beautiful for planetary studies and double stars and so on. And also a 14 inch go to Celestron. So we really have some marvelous um, equipment out there. And there are also a variety of uh, smaller telescopes, most of which are kept in the in the roll-off dome. Now, this building back here is going to the main clubhouse and it has a uh, lecture room in here. You can see a picture of the interior of it during one of our functions. And that's where we hear the, the where we give the public talks 
and uh, also entertain various special groups. Final thing is the Cedar Amateur Astronomers are part of a meteor network. We have three meteor cameras, one at the observatory and two at members' houses. And you can get the equipment and get software and solve for the meteor trajectories and put that into a large database. So this is just a brief view of the Cedar Amateur Astronomer. So I think it's it's neat to get to know where the various astronomy clubs are in the uh, in the Midwest, and there are really quite a few of them. Now, on the subject of um, amateur astronomy in general, I would like to uh, make a bit of an exhortation or a sales pitch, which was is to I think all of us can uh, uh, occupy ourselves by trying to uh, agitate for uh, making state parks a great place to uh, for star watching. Many of these state parks, of course, are um, away from large cities. They have lots of trees to block light, and it's naturally a, um, a good place to observe. Now, often the people that are using the campgrounds generate their own lights, and I was really inspired. I've, I've camped a lot in Texas because our uh, older son lives there, so we camp in Texas state parks. And they have these stickers in many of the parks on the electric power uh, boxes. And you can read this, and it's an exhortation to turn off the lights after, at night so people can, can see stars. And, and I've told the people that work at the parks that, uh, that I think that's really great, that I uh, certainly appreciate that. And I think all of us should be making an attempt to encourage our own state park systems to be more astronomy um, uh, oriented. Okay, with that kind of, I'll then move on to the um, the subject of tonight, which is uh, Venus. So again, it's very prominent in the sky right now. And of course, that's been known, uh, noticed by all human societies throughout history. Uh, the one that is perhaps the most intriguing is the Mayan culture, which not only noticed Venus, but they, they made it a, a super important part of their calendar system. And this is an excerpt of the uh, what's called the Dresden Codex, which is essentially a calculation um, manual for calculating out the time of the appearances of Venus. And what you see here down are these dots and dashes. You might think those look like numbers, and they in fact are numbers. The Mayans evidently had a base 20 number system, and they had a de decimal system or something where there was placeholders for expressing very large numbers, which is a very sophisticated scheme. And so one of the uh, important attributes of Venus is what we call the synodic period of it, which is how that's not the period that you would observe for Venus to go around the, uh, the sun if you were in an alien spaceship, but rather from here on Earth, when do we see it from, say, one when it's at its uh, most prominent in the evening sky to the next time that will happen. And that period is a synodic period of Venus, which is 583.92 days. And it turns out the Mayans knew that this was 0.92 and not 84. And a lot of this Dresden Codex was to uh, scheme, a numerical scheme evidently, to allow people to calculate that out. So it's remarkable. This is a representation of Venus in the, um, in the Mayan uh, pantheon. And it just shows how different societies can uh, really be very similar in the outlook in some ways and very different in others. To the Mayans, Venus was a male war god represented here. You can see the club and the shield rather than Aphrodite like we have in the uh, the ancient Middle East and the um, the West. So this is just kind of an indication of when you look at Venus, you can think about all of these societies throughout human history that have been doing the same sort of thing. Okay, so let's then talk about a somewhat more modern uh, view of, of Venus. So um, when I begin talking about solar system objects, the, for me, the first thing to talk about is where are they in the solar system? So this is a diagram from the Jet Propulsion Solar System Calculator, which is a <clears throat> very useful program that will show uh, the solar system objects at any time you want. You want to? I didn't run this for right now. This is back in March, about the time I gave my uh, um, a talk at the Cedar Amateur Astronomers. But this then shows the uh, orbits of the innermost four planets in the solar system. So here we have the Sun. 
and going outward, of course, there's Mercury, Venus, here we are at the Earth, and here is Mars. So this gives you then the rough idea of what's going on, as most people know. Venus is the, um, the next innermost planet in the solar system, and this gives a rough idea of the corresponding radii of the orbits, or actually I shouldn't say radii, to be um, precise about it, the orbits are ellipses, so it's a semi-major axis. But in the case of the both the Earth and Venus, uh, these ellipses are very close to circles, so you can roughly think of it as a um, as a um, astronomical or as a as a circle. So right now, when I did this in March, this was the relative orientation of Venus. Right now, it's getting pretty close to the furthest angle, the so-called elongation that it gets from the sun. It's going to be that for a long time, as like we're here. And then Venus is coming around this, this sort of tangent point here. So there's a period for well over a month when it's right about 44 or 45 degrees like right now. So the bigger that elongation, the later it sets after the sun and it's better to be able to see it in a, uh, in a dark sky. So this is then a picture of where it is Venus is in the solar system so we can kind of have a roadmap right at the outset. Well, and uh, let's just sort of put some numbers on this, as I think probably most of the uh, Minnesota Astronomical Society members are aware. The yardstick we use for describing uh, distances in the solar system is the astronomical unit, which is the average distance of the uh, between the sun and the earth. And that's 149.6 million kilometers, or if we're used to thinking in miles, 93 million miles. Very large by any terrestrial standards. So the average distance of Venus from the sun is 0.72 ast uh, astronomical units. So it's about three quarters of the way out from the sun that we are. So relatively close. Now, the next closest planet that ever comes to the Earth is Mars. We had a recent close appearance or a opposition of it in December, but it's 1.552 astronomical units. So it's about half an astronomical unit away at its closest as about 0.3 for Venus. So that means that Venus comes closer to the Earth than any other major planet, 26 million miles versus 35 million for Mars, and those are the closest values. Venus is going to be, in the next couple of months, coming up to its closest approach to the Earth, while Mars is getting further and further away all the time, and we won't see it really close again until about two years from now. So that's kind of, again, where we are in the solar system. Venus, what do this object that we're talking about, where is it? Now, um, uh, an amateur astronomer will always be interested in what does it uh, look like when we look at Venus through a telescope. So if you say, okay, we figured out how far away it is, it comes close, it should be a fairly rewarding object to, um, to look at in a telescope. So what do we see when we do that? Well, here is a, um, <clears throat> a set of pictures. These are actually pictures taken at the uh, 2004 evening star apparition, but right now Venus is going through this same set of uh, appearances. And of course, the first thing you notice, which is remarkable, is it goes through a set of um, phases just like the moon. And there was in your club meeting here a little bit earlier, I noticed the reference to doing observations like um, um, uh, Galileo made. And of course, that was the um, <clears throat> Um, one of the observations uh, Galileo made and uh, realized the significance of it. And I was told once that uh, um, the, he wrote this in Latin as uh, Cynthia emulat matrem amoris, which is a poetic name for Venus is Cynthia. Venus imitates, or the Cynthia is the moon. Cynthia meaning the moon imitates the mother of love, which is a very poetic way of saying Venus has phases just like the moon does. And that helped them put together that the, uh, the idea that the uh, solar system really was um, heliocentric rather than geocentric. So what these pictures show is that if you look over, a, this was in, in uh, 2004 between March and May, you see two things happen is the phases go then from being more like a, a half moon, slightly gibbous uh, phase, 
to half phase and then an increasingly uh, narrower crescent. But unlike the moon, you see, um, you see it getting bigger and bigger in angular size. And I checked it out last night with my own uh, 90 millimeter Orion refractor that I, I enjoy using. And this is about what it was last night. So the angular size is about 20 arc seconds and it has this slightly gibbous um, shape to it. And it turns out that right now it's the, v the difference between distance between us and Venus is about 0.95 astronomical units. So a little bit less than one AU. So again, when it comes closest, when it's at um, so-called inferior conjunction like this, it's going to be 0.28 astronomical units, so much, much larger. So the angular diameter right now is about 17 arc seconds. So again, my 90 millimeter Orion with the 10 millimeter eyepiece shows that very nicely, but it's going to be getting bigger. It's going to, uh, over the next few months, if you look at it in a telescope, it will get bigger in angular size. So that all looks very good. So you might say, if I take my Orion telescope and look at the moon, I can see some details on it. If I look at Jupiter, I see lots of stuff to see, the great red spot, the bands, the moons, and so on. But if I look at Venus, it just looks like a billiard ball, maybe a slightly fuzzy billiard ball. I don't see any details on the surface at all. So you might say, well, wow, that's very odd. And why is that? Is that really what the surface of Venus looks like? So it's uh, much less interesting, say, than looking at Mars at, uh, at opposition. Now, um, the reason I think it probably people here know is when we're looking at Venus, we're seeing not the surface, but the top of a perpetual cloud layer. So Venus is continually overcast all the time. No one has ever seen the surface of Venus from um, out in outer space, from the Earth or even closer at a visible wavelength. And this illustrates this. This is a picture taken of Venus. I can't remember which spacecraft, maybe the uh, Mariner Venus in the 1970s. Um, but this shows even if you were uh, coming very close to Venus in a, with a spacecraft and at visible wavelengths, the kind of light that our eye uses looking at it, this is what you see. If you got up close, you could start to see a few patterns in the clouds, but it's it's pretty clear from a picture like this, we're not seeing to the surface, we're seeing the upper uh, upper layers of clouds. So that's point number one, is that it's it comes very close to the earth, we need to, um, and uh, we can get a good picture of it with, a, with our telescopes, but it's disappointing that we really can't tell what the nature of this object is on the surface. But we can go and say, how does it stack up essentially relative to the Earth? As I think people attracted to astronomy know, <clears throat> astronomical objects range enormously in their sizes and masses and so on. So, so what is Venus like? Is it much, much smaller than the Earth or is it uh, much, much larger? Well, the answer is neither. It's actually pretty similar. So these are um, the sizes of what are called the terrestrial planets, the um, so-called Earth-like planets, but these are the four inner planets in the solar system. So over here, I think I'll get my pen out and play with this. So over here on the left side, we have Mercury. So that gives the size of it, not much bigger than the moon actually. And over here we have Mars, uh, which we can see in Gemini tonight. And of course is um, subject of, it's a, it's a rewarding object to see in a reasonable sized amateur telescope, at least at times of oppositions. But you can see it's, um, it's relatively small compared to the Earth. It's only about half the diameter, only about 11% of the mass. But when you go to Venus now, you can see it's pretty similar in uh, overall diameter. Now you might be asking, well, that looks like a picture of the surface. How did you get that if you just uh, told us we can never see the surface? I'll get to that in a moment. But just in terms of its overall diameter at this point, we can see that it is pretty close to being like the Earth, unlike any of the other planets. Okay, so we can go on and kind of summarize some of these, uh, what we found so far. So here is, first of all, we call the semi-major axis of the orbit, roughly speaking, the radius of its orbit around the sun. 0.72 astronomical units versus one. So in our same neighborhood as space, 
the diameters are like this. So again, very similar, 12,000 kilometers to about 13,000 kilometers. If we look at what the masses are, then it turns out Venus is about 82% of the mass of the Earth. And over here, I put two exclamation marks indicating not only in diameter is it similar, but in mass it is as well. And we think that the composition of it is probably largely a similar, a large rocky object. So this then, if we would just say as spheres, if you could shrink them down and put them on your uh, desktop, the Earth and Venus are very similar. And so that then leads to the picture that, or the, the term in my talk, Earth's twin. Now, given this similarity, you might think the conditions on the surface of Venus would be similar too, all right? So it's, uh, it's closer to the sun, but maybe these clouds block out some of the sunlight. So, you know, maybe there's actually um, fairly Earth-like conditions under those cloud layers. And that was believed to be the case for a very long time uh, on the basis of very little evidence. Now, it turns out that uh, particular bubble was very suddenly pricked in 1958. And uh, in my career, I've been a radio astronomer. I've been very proud of radio astronomy. It's a fantastic discipline. This is a picture of this wasn't the, this is not the telescope that made this discovery. This is the 100 meter um, um, radio telescope at the Green Bank Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia. So if you're traveling through West Virginia, I'd strongly recommend going out those observatories in a beautiful part of the country. And it was really the, the first place to do radio astronomy in the United States. And um, so what happened is in 1958, radio astronomers started looking at Venus with the telescopes that were available at the time, nothing near as powerful as this, but they were adequate to determine that Venus was really drastically different from the Earth in a very important way. And it turns out that the reason for this is, first of all, uh, radio waves can go through those clouds of uh, Venus. So it says the, the clouds will block uh, light from getting through. So we can't see a light signal transmitted from the surface of Venus, or if you were on the surface of Venus, you couldn't see stars at night. So those clouds block visible light, but the uh, they're completely transparent to uh, radio wavelengths, say, the kind of um, wavelengths of uh, 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 waves that you use with your cell phone or that you use for satellite TV and things like that. And so that's sort of point number one. So any radiation that comes from the surface of Venus comes right through the clouds and, and comes out. The second thing is that one of the laws of physics is that objects are, that are at a temperature greater than what we call absolute zero radiate radiation, they glow essentially. And the hotter they are, the more power they radiate and the shorter the wavelength at which they radiate. And what radio astronomers realized is that Venus was much, much, much more brighter. The radio emission from it was much brighter than it would have been if the temperature was anything like the surface of the earth. And so as a result, they deduced from these observations, um, all almost um, going on 65 years ago or so, that the surface of Venus was very, very hot. So here are some of the, the numbers that came out eventually from this analysis. Radio astronomy allows us to measure the surface temperature of Venus. This was done first in the late 50s and the, the analysis was completed in the 1960s. And so the surface temperature is 730 degrees Kelvin. That's a temperature scheme we physicists like to use. And we consider it superior to anything like centigrade. It's essentially degrees centigrade above absolute zero. Now, when I talk about temperatures, when I do, do think science, I think of the Kelvin system as the only one. But if I want to wonder what kind of clothes to wear when I go out in the morning, I think Fahrenheit like everybody else. That's 855 degrees Fahrenheit. So, which is kind of a mind boggling number. It's really one of the hottest places you could find the solar system. The standard term that people say is that that's the temperature of an oven on the self cleaning cycle. And so this then indicates um, with regard to the Earth's twin, that it really is an Earth's twin, that it, uh, it's similar in diameter and mass, 
But boy, it's different in this very, very major way, and certainly a major way in terms of uh, the questions of life existing on other planets. There's no form of life we know of could exist at these temperatures. So the big question, of course, that comes out and has dominated the study of Venus for a long time is what is responsible for this sort of temperature? And the answer to that is that we know and I'll give you a hint, I might to get into this later on if time permits or maybe not, but the greenhouse effect is real. And in fact, this is where in Venus, I think was where people really began to realize um, uh, this effect. And in fact, to do a little bit of an advertisement for the um, um, University of Iowa, there is one of the foremost um, climate scientists in the United States, James Hansen, is a graduate of the University of Iowa. He was both an undergraduate uh, here and got his PhD in the 1960s, working on trying to understand why the temperature of Venus was so, um, so high. And he came to the conclusion it was because it has a very dense carbon dioxide atmosphere. And of course, then that led into the Earth has carbon dioxide in its atmosphere to a much, much, much lower level, but we're increasing it over time. So I think that that's in very early on with uh, Jim Hansen put in his mind that car that carbon dioxide can can have a big effect in determining the surface of uh, surface temperature of any planet and in Venus you probably have something what's called a runaway greenhouse effect okay so this is a picture of actually a uh, globe that is made of Venus and uh, so it's color coded according to elevation. Now you might say, uh, and when I taught um, general education astronomy classes at Iowa, I would take this globe that you can get from Sky and Telescope magazine, buy one and pass it around to the students and then ask them, well, if everything I've, based on everything I've told you so far, how can we make a globe of this thing if we can't see the, um, the surface of it? So this really is, a topographical globe of a Venus. And again, you can get order these from the company that publishes Sky and Telescope. And essentially what's going on here is the blue areas are very low, the green are somewhat higher, and the red are then white are the highest regions at all. So it's like a topographic map. So it's like it's it's like a globe that you can look and you could sell real estate on the basis of how could we know that? Well, this largely came about from a NASA mission in, that uh, called Magellan, which was an orbiting spacecraft. It orbited uh, Venus for several years. Uh, it arrived there in 1990, and it was an imaging radar system. So this is a, a picture of Magellan in uh, orbit around the sun. So there's the sun off there. Here's Venus here. It has its solar panels for power oriented, and the what looks like the communication dish is pointed down, not up. And so there was a radar there. And so it was pinging the surface of uh, Venus with radar signals. And over the mission, it was able to um, uh, map almost the entire um, surface of Venus with very high resolution down to the order of a kilometer or something like that. Now, it turned out Magellan was in the early 90s before that, going back 15 or 20 years, this radar mapping technique had been done extensively at the recently uh, uh, collapsed Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. And that was one of the main things they did there was to use that large dish and had a powerful radio transmitter to uh, do radar studies of Venus. They didn't have the resolution that Magellan did, but it did give us some of the ideas. Now there's a lot of uh, text on this, which is usually uh, pretty boring, but these are kind of important things of what Magellan did. So it was able to send radar, say, transmit radar signals from the Magellan spacecraft. Radar signals are radio waves. They are transmitted from the radars on the Magellan, went through the clouds, bounced off the surface and came back. So what they were able to do, these radio, radar signals were first of all used to measure the height because the higher the surface of Venus, the sooner the radar signal would bounce back and the lower ones, the signal would bounce back la uh, later. So you could do kind of time delay reflectometry, it's called. So you could, you could measure the topography and that's very important for putting together a globe indicating 
where there are sort of mountain, more mountainous areas and, and lower lying areas. And the other thing they had was the radar reflectivity, which is some parts of the surface of Venus reflected, um, reflected these waves better than others. And the radar reflectivity is, is hard to associate. It doesn't, it wouldn't necessarily uh, correspond to say the color or the brightness or darkness of regions. It has to do with the radar property, but it is telling you something. So here we again state this uh, Magellan went for about four years and it provided us with a view of the surface of quote, Earth's twin. Okay, so here is what is the surface of Venus look like? And here is an actual representation from put together from the Magellan uh, data. Of course, one of the advantages we have with having computers nowadays is we can take the Magellan data of this uh, height and reflectivity and not just have it as sort of an over, uh, sort of an overhead view, but we can then use that in a computer to represent what a three-dimensional view would be. So if you were flying in some kind of spacecraft with a lot of insulation and a good refrigeration unit over the surface of some part of Venus, this is what you'd see. So there are flat planes there. There are these funny kind of marks here. You can see off in the distance this kind of mountain, and uh, it turns out that um, if you look at these and uh, long enough or enough of them, and if you're particularly if you're a ge geologist, you begin to recognize these as what are called shield volcanoes. That's one of the kind of volcanoes. The Hawaiian Islands are of that sort. So there are at least extinct volcanoes on the surface of um, surface of Venus. Here then is something that most amateur astronomers would recognize as a crater, uh, like we have in the moon. So a circular hole in the ground, eject a blanket and a central peak. So there are impact craters on Venus, but not too many of them. And I'll return to that later because that's, uh, that's a very important point. All right. So here is another way of representing these data just in terms of the height. And it's to, it's to emphasize an important point. When people looked at this, they found the surface of Venus was roughly, there were two big areas which were elevated by several kilometers above these kind of low flat areas. And these were called uh, Aphrodite Terra and Ishtar Terra. And these are roughly the size of continents on Earth. I think they're like the size of Australia, for instance. And then these are the low-lying areas, so it's reminiscent of if you could take all the water off on Earth, you'd see something similar, where the continental areas are thicker crust and they're up higher, and then the low-lying of what's the ocean bottom. So, the, of course, there's no water on Venus with a temperature of 855 degrees Fahrenheit, but the topography of the planet is um, shows something similar to what the Earth would have if you got rid of all the water on it. Okay, so um, one of the things I'm going to try this, I don't know whether this works, I think I have to actually get out and show this, but there is a YouTube where they have taken the Magellan data and actually um, simulated a flight over the surface of the planet. So I'm going to stop here for a second and um, and we'll see if that um, uh, works. Let's see here. It doesn't look like it is. There's one, some trick. Let me try these going back to the slideshow again. Current slide. Okay, so let's try this, see how this works. I think the main thing we want to do is to give it some time to load the thing in. But this is very much worth looking at. Um, if it doesn't work, what I'd recommend you do is go on YouTube and put in something like Magellan Flight Over Venus, and you'll find us. So we'll, we'll give a couple minutes here and see how see if it, uh, if it loads up. Now, while we're waiting for that, if there are any questions people have, I'd be uh, happy to entertain them. Might yeah, not I have one. Good. Uh, you, <laughs> the temperature of Venus, does it fluctuate? Does it have like a high and a low? Or does it stay pretty constant? I don't, I think it stays constant. I think there are not very, I don't think the, I think it's pretty constant over the surface. And I think the reason for that 
is that the atmosphere is so good at redistributing heat that you don't get the, I mean, you don't have the day-night variation because the atmosphere traps so much heat in there. So that's kind of my, my sort of hunch, uh, Trina, but that, that's a good question, whether the, there's a, say, a pole to equator variation like there is on Earth. And I, I think there is not just because of the, the effect of the atmosphere. Just like, okay, so here we go. So I'm not going to run this for the full five minutes. Uh, let's see if we can expand it. Let's do the. Let's try. So this shows flying by some of these uh, volcanoes, for instance. And it shows it's, um, there's a crater we were seeing, but to me, it's really remarkable that we can do this. And that's, that's one of the advantages of the, uh, uh, what NASA, what we can do with these spacecraft missions nowadays is you can get the data and represent it in this form that allows everybody to have the excitement of doing something which are actually being possible and it'd be 855 degrees. So here we're going over the top of this field volcano. I think I'm going to actually pause it at that point because uh, I think you get the general idea of that. And then I'll continue with my talk. And again, I would, uh, I would encourage anybody that wants to, um, 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 to do that to, uh, let's see if I can get rid of that. There we go. Um, to look at that, to get on YouTube, I wouldn't write that. You don't have to write that number down again, just, uh, do YouTube and do, Magellan fly over of Venus and see that. It's it's really striking. There was another one that they've done, and again, using the capability of uh, the format that the data is in nowadays, of um, um, the Huygens spacecraft as it parachuted down to Titan. And so it shows a representation of that, which I just found uh, tremendously interesting. So at any rate, the point is, after taking all that Magellan data, we can put it together and have kind of a picture of the geography, certainly, and also the geological history of Venus. So let me talk a little bit about that then. Now, the main point that I think we learned from this is that, again, here is a picture of one of these impact craters like the moon. But if you, you could probably get the idea then uh, from looking at that video on YouTube, that there are many fewer craters than there are on the moon, and that's important. And um, planetary scientists are able to count the number of craters on the surface of an object and get an idea of how long that surface has been exposed um, uh, to outer space. So uh, in the case of the Earth, we have very few, very few impact craters. And the reason for that is the surface is always being churned up by uh, things like glaciers or uh, rainstorms and things like that. And so when people do this account, they come up with the, uh, the uh, conclusion that the surface of Venus has only been exposed to impacts for about 500 to maybe 600 million years ago. And that's true all over the planet. The, it turns out most of these low-lying areas are, uh, are believed to be basaltic rock. And so the conclusion that people have come to, which is very, very important, is that the whole surface of Venus was essentially repaved about 500 to 600 million years ago. And so what that means is evidently there was a big outflowing of lava from the interior of the planet that completely covered the entire planet, solidified, and we've only seen craters since that time. So this is a way that we can use these observations of craters to tell us something very important about the, um, about the uh, existence of Venus. So clearly we know that it must have been repaved because uh, there's nothing else that could have done that. Again, there's no weather on Venus or glaciers or things like that. So it must have been um, a flow of lava from the interior. So one of the things we can come up with is what caused that and what were the effects of that? And that gets, um, um, then a, uh, into an end. Now I'm, I'm looking at the chat and it says, is Venus tidally locked? 
And the answer to that is no, uh, in the way we usually think of. The periods of the, um, the uh, orbital period around the sun is 225 days and the rotation period is about 243 days. So it's not locked. There is a funny resonance with between uh, Venus and the Earth, but it's like a five-eighths one and so on. But it's not tidally locked in the way that, say, Mercury is. Although Mercury is not one-to-one -one either. It's, uh, it's a two-to-three tidal locking. Or the best examples of tidal locking is, say, the Earth's moon and Venus, for instance. Okay, so uh, there's been lots and lots of speculations about uh, this uh, 500 to 600 million year ago event and what were, the, um, what were the consequences of this. But let's just kind of summarize first what we've, uh, what we've learned from the radar exploration of Venus. So there are a lot of similarities. There are low flat areas that resemble ocean floors on Earth. There are two higher areas of thicker crust uh, that resemble the continental portions of the crust on Earth, Ishtar and Aphrodite. And these are about the size of Australia. And there's no sign of tectonic plate boundaries. If you could drain the water away from the Earth and looked at it, you'd see like these big sutures, which are these cracks in the crust of the Earth. And of course, on the Earth, the, there are these big plates that are moving around like bumper cars. And that's not happening on Venus, at least at the present time. So that's kind of some of the things we've learned. Now, um, so we have a, uh, so there are remaining questions that we have about Venus, and there's, uh, there's lots of those. So uh, the first one that people would ask is, why is the surface temperature so high? And that, uh, that is certainly um, known to be the case. Again, this atmosphere that we're looking at, these are clouds, probably mainly made of sulfuric acid droplets. But the atmosphere is heavy, heavily carbon dioxide. It's like 96% carbon dioxide as opposed to 0.04% for the Earth. And the surface pressure on Venus is 90 times the atmospheric pressure outside right now. So that dense, heavy carbon dioxide atmosphere is what's causing the temperature so to be so high. Now, when we look at these pictures um, uh, that's showing that it looks like the same continental plate uh, um, ocean bottom topography you have on the Earth, the question comes up is, did Venus ever have oceans like the Earth? And the answer to that is we don't know, and, uh, and, but that is one of the big questions in uh, planetary science. So, and the next question, of course, then comes about, if it did have oceans, where did they go? And um, there's a lot, we don't know for sure on any of these things, but there's a lot of speculation right now. And the recent speculation on this is that we've seen that 500 to 600 million years ago, there was this big event, if you will, um, on Venus's repaving massive outflowing of lava from the interior of the Earth. And what people speculate is they, uh, that may have caused the uh, big CO2 buildup in the atmosphere of Venus, drove the temperature to extremes, and the, um, and the oceans that uh, were there evaporated. That's speculative. So I, rec I say recent speculation about that. And uh, what the speculation says is, let's go back here. So re what the recent speculation says is maybe Venus was Earth-like for a few billion years, because after all, the solar system objects formed four and a half billion years ago. This event on Venus that may or may not have been associated with the buildup of the atmosphere and the disappearance of any oceans was only about half a billion years ago. So it is possible that Venus was in an Earth-like state for four billion years, and it's only in the last half billion years that it has become uh, the really hellish environment that it is. It was flipped into its present state. If you're interested in reading more about that, it turns out that there is a scientist named David Grinspoon, who's actually into science popularization as well. Um, I imagine some of you subscribe to Sky and Telescope, which I'm a big advocate of, and Grinspoon has um, uh, articles in there about, I think, every other month. 
And many of these deal with, um, with the nature of Venus and the arguments for uh, continuing exploration. And one of the things about that people that study uh, Venus have been in a bad mood about is it's 30 years since the last NASA mission to uh, Mars, which was Magellan. And in the meantime, there have been many, many Mars in, in, uh, missions. And they say, here we have these big burning scientific questions about Venus, but we're not getting the spacecraft missions to, uh, to go there and answer that. So as I'll state here in a, another moment or two, that, that may be changing. But if you're interested in reading more of that, get a hold of some back issues of Sky and Telescope and look for articles by David Grinspoon, and he'll describe most of these points. So one of his comments in one of the scientific papers he was uh, um, writing, I really like this statement. He says, both the similarities and dissimilarities between the Earth and the Venus raise challenging questions. And so essentially the similarities are how can these two rocks that are in the roughly the same part of the solar system, roughly the same diameter, roughly same mass, so similar in that respect, and so different in terms of their um, of their surface properties. And I think Grinspoon likes to sort of foster the belief that maybe they weren't always that way. And that would be very interesting to have future spacecraft missions to see whether we can learn more about this. Now, um, it turns out NASA has finally decided, yeah, that sounds like a good idea and we'd like to, to, like to look into this. And there are a couple of missions that uh, are planned for the future. And the one that I, I principally highlighted is a mission called Da Vinci Plus. And I think that is going ahead full, full bore. Here is the NASA uh, uh, sort of promotion and propaganda um, public relations slide for it. And what you see is this supposed to represent the surface of Venus. And you can see this sphere here. I think it's like a meter in diameter parachuting slowly down to the surface of Venus. So Da Vinci Plus will have a, a mother spacecraft, which will do flyby imaging of the surface at infrared wavelengths. And at a certain infrared wavelength, you can see down to the surface of Venus. So they're gonna try and image it better. And then this probe, which is going to slowly descend through the atmosphere to regions on, regions on the surface of the uh, Venus, which are called tesserae regions. They're little patches of, of the surface of Venus that were uh, imaged by Magellan, where the topography looks very, very different. And there's pretty good reasons for believing those are the oldest parts of the crust of Venus. So that's really what you would like to look at if you think that Venus may at one time have been more Earth-like. So the plan right now is for it to be launched in June of 2029 and that the probe descent to the surface is in June of 2031. So that's a few years off, not quite 10 years from now, it's conceivable that we would be able to then uh, learn more about the surface of Venus and maybe begin to get more information about these intriguing questions about whether it was uh, more Earth-like in the remote past. Now, if you follow things like uh, space.com and so on, this whole thing got kind of a setback recently because it was supposed to be a preliminary mission to Da Vinci called Veritas, which was supposed to do a detailed imaging of the surface. And that has been delayed considerably. So they're now talking about the launch of that being in the 2030s. So that one of the problems is that could impact uh, da Vinci. So things don't look quite as rosy as they did a few months ago, but uh, the jury's still out on that. Okay, so this is just a picture of them just about done. This shows what the earth would look like with no water. Again, these high regions, which are the continental plates, the low regions it looks very similar to Venus, but if you got all the water away, you'd see the crustal boundaries like the uh, plate boundaries like the mid-Atlantic mid, uh, Ridge. Here's a picture of a crater on Venus. We actually have pictures from the surface of Venus in the 19, uh, I think they were in the 80s. They landed a couple of spacecraft that lasted there for a few minutes and gave us pictures from this uh, couple of sites. And then the final thing I'd like to say is one that there is a textbook I used for many years in teaching astronomy classes by John Fix called Astronomy Journey of the uh, uh, Cosmic Frontier. 
um, where this is kind of ties together the study of Venus and a current issue about global, global warming on the Earth. And so I'll just read this as uh, the picture now emerging is one of a Venus that began to evolve along a path similar to that of the Earth, but suffered a catas catastrophe in the form of a runaway greenhouse early in its lifetime. I think since this book was written, we'd now argue that might have been quite late in its lifetime, 500 million years ago. Clearly, this story carries a lesson with it for humanity, lest it trigger a similar catastrophe here on Earth. The chain chances, that should be chances, the chances seem to be very small that such an event can happen, but prudence suggests that the probability be evaluated with the case of Venus in mind. So that's all I have to say about this really very intriguing planet. Um, and again, there are intriguing scientific questions that uh, we can look forward to. And furthermore, as a sort of small telescope astronomers, we can get out and enjoy it in the night sky here for the next couple of months. So thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you. Am I on again? OK. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, is there any right questions in house? Hold on. We got to get a microphone. Not me. <laughs> yep. Yep. Should be on. Um, I was wondering, uh, is it possible when, at the time when they believed that it was could have been Earth-like or whatever with, with um, oceans and all, that maybe there was dinosaurs on the surface? Yep, yep, or some kind of life. No, that would be, um, that. Uh, that's exactly what people are wondering about. And I think that my feeling is probably with, with the, the Venus specialist, which I'm not, um, uh, have gotten themselves worked into a fit about that they haven't gotten these spacecraft missions. I just think that it has been largely because as opposed to Mars, where there's really good reasons there for believing that you might if you go there, you might find out whether there was life there at some time in the past or not. Venus right now is so um, it's so out of the question that you kind of figure it's not worth asking. But the question you're asking is, is it possible that there was life there for a very long period of time? And I think that's exactly what people have in mind. And so if you read some of these articles that like um, uh, Grinspoon has been uh, writing and other ones, the uh, some of the the um, the ideas that have influenced the de uh, design of this Da Vinci is to try and see if you can at least determine whether or not there were big oceans on the surface. And there are what they're essentially want to look for is mineralogical evidence of um, of oceans having been uh, on the surface of Venus and then presumably evaporated away. And it turns out if you had an ocean on top on, in an area and then it's evaporated, uh, there's ways of telling that from the minerals. I mean, here in Iowa, for instance, there's a, a town called Fort Dodge, which is not far from Interstate 35 on the way up to uh, Minneapolis. And it has a uh, big gypsum deposits, which is an evaporate. So it indicates that in the past, there was, I think it's called the Intercontinental uh, Seaway in like the Jurassic period, there was the ocean coming through the middle of the United States. And evidently there were areas where seawater flowed into these regions, evaporated, and then left what's now this gypsum. And so they're planning to, to try and look at that. So I think um, no one, is, I think, is proposing actually astro, astro archaeology or astro paleontology uh, experiments like they're talking about on Mars. I think what they're first of all trying to do is, can you see evidence of uh, mineralogical evidence for previous oceans, or there even is one of the papers I was reading and preparing for this, some that either channels you can see in these tesserae and they say they look like old rivers. So that that's where, that's the level they're at right now. I think that if you could indicate somehow that a billion years ago there were oceans on Venus, then that would be a powerful argument that that, um, that maybe other life um, developed as well. Now, when you mention dinosaurs, the thing you have to keep in mind is that the Earth is four and a half billion years ago, but multicellular life didn't appear until about 600 million years ago, about the time this, uh, this big repaving event happened on Venus. So 
uh, complex life was fairly, a fairly late development in the history of Earth. We don't know whether that's that's a universal law, obviously, since we only have one case. But yeah, that's, that's something very interesting to think about. Yourself off. <laughs> I held it too long and it shut itself off. Um, uh, my name is Alan Touchberry. I've got a uh, not so much a question, but the club down there is really cool. If you get a chance to get down there, uh, it's a great observing site. I spent a lot of really nice nights there from the late 90s through the early 2000s. Uh, family farm is about six miles away from the Palace oh. House Observatory. Right on there. Where is your farm? Um, it's on Seven Sisters Road. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. W6E. So it's yep. at the south end of Ely. And uh, people that were farming it with my parents, my parents have passed away now. Uh, but the folks that do Dan and Debbie's Creamery in Ely uh, yeah. own the farm. Okay. Now, I know Seven Sisters Road, there were times when the Cedar River flooded and I'd take my students on the field trip on a school bus down that. It's a pretty wild road ride for in a school bus. <laughs> but the, uh, the observatory there is really great. And uh, the club used to have a, a talk that I did on file uh, that they would use occasionally. I did several talks for them in the late 90s, early 2000s about solar system distances using a special paper called heliocentric illustrative tissue. Sure, and, sure. Uh, it was squares that were a million miles on a side, and it was actually a hands-on demonstration using toilet paper. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan, thank you for the, um, uh, thank you for the, um, the endorsement there. I mean, I certainly share your opinion. I'd say this. This Eastern Iowa Observatory and Learning Center, which probably was built after you were uh, had gone then, because I think that was 2006 that was dedicated. But it is beautiful. I mean, the whole facility right now, I think you, you can't think of a better place to kind of enjoy astronomy and teach other people about it. It's just a fantastic facility. So thanks a lot for your, your, um, your plug for us. Hello. Yes, hi. Hi, this is Dean. Um, my question is about the potential connection between whatever event happened 500 million years ago and the fact that Venus, Venus's rotation is retrograde compared to yep. Earth, for example. Yep. Yes, uh, that's a good question. I don't know if there is any connection. Um, there could be. I am sort of not enough of a geologist. Um, to be able to answer that. I don't know whether the real planetary geologists could either. Um, what Dean is referring to is that um, all the major planets have so-called prograde rotation. So if you're in the alien spaceship looking down the solar system from above, you would see the planets orbiting in a um, counterclockwise fashion, and they're rotating in a counterclockwise fashion as well, except Venus, which is actually very slowly rotating in the opposite or the retrograde um, sense. So, you know, probably it got nailed by a big impact, just like the Earth did. The Earth's impact produced the moon, and it must have had an impact. It's, it's probably that was due to some big impact late in its development that for whatever reason, it didn't produce a moon. Um, whether that had to do with the big repaving event is, uh, I don't know. It's I've heard this often speculated. This could be the reason, it, unlike the Earth, it doesn't have a strong magnetic field. So the Earth is, uh, Earth and Venus are very similar as rocks, but the Earth has is the strongest magnetic field of the terrestrial planets, and it's the strongest magnetic field until you get to Jupiter and Saturn. And that almost certainly has to do with the combination of the rotation and convection in the interior of the Earth. So since Venus is rotating so slowly, probably that dynamo that generated the magnetic field never operated. But at any rate, it has almost no or 
zero uh, intrinsic magnetic field. So I think I've heard that um, the slow rotation implicated in that, whether the, the big repaving event. Now, uh, I'll give you an, an even scarier possibility, which is those kind of things happen on Earth too. There's, um, I know enough geology to know that there's a thing called uh, large igneous provinces or LIPs, L-I-P's, and it, there are times when the Earth um, sort of exgorges, um, you know, large amounts of lava can be for a long period of time. That, for instance, the Yellowstone area is one of those. And there was one called the Siberian Flats that went on about 250 million years ago. And I think is the real, um, it's pretty convincing that that's what caused what was um, called the end Permian extinction, which was the biggest extinction event on Earth. So the Earth does things like that too, but not as extreme as uh, Venus did. And the thing with this um, 250 million years ago, it probably was a CO2 buildup associated with that that caused this big uh, mass extinction on Earth, but it didn't completely wipe life out. So you actually led into my question. Uh, since Venus doesn't have a magnetic field, yep. uh, have there been any studies uh, into whether that helped to cause this runaway greenhouse effect? Well, I I don't think so. I think that, in fact, it may have in some ways, uh, <laughs> and, you know, sort of tended to work in the other direction. And I think the reason for that is um, there's something called the solar wind, which is a flow of material out from the sun, and uh, it can kind of sandblast away a planetary atmosphere. We think that's partly why the uh, atmosphere of Mars is so, uh, is so tenuous right now. In the case of the Earth, it has a big magnetosphere. There's like a big bar magnet that deflects the um, the solar wind when it's still far from the Earth's atmosphere. So the fact that it didn't have a uh, magnetic field means the solar wind comes down and makes direct contact with the atmosphere. So if anything, uh, that would have helped to try and avoid. So if without that, if it had a magnetic field, that probably would be even the C the greenhouse effect would probably be even worse. That's my speculation on this, but uh, I think, you know, I think it's based on good things. People think that um, the solar wind can ablate an atmosphere, and Venus, of course, is closer to the solar wind, so it turns out that the density of the gas is even higher, too. Perfect. I think we have a couple more questions in house here, too. Um, it was, I think, a year or two ago, I, I read that they found traces of phosphine on uh, yeah. in the sphere of Venus, and that may have been this tiniest, tiniest little hint of life, uh, but I haven't heard anything since then. Have you, has there been any more about that story? Yeah, that's kind of a, like they say in football terminology, a loose ball. So that, that came out, um, and it was a detection of a, um, a emission line, I think, in the radio part of the spectrum that they attributed to phosphine. And um, so the idea of phosphine is like methane, but with a phosphorus replacing the carbon, I think is what it is. I think that's what it is, phosphine. And um, so it turns out on Earth, most of the time it's generated by um, living organisms. It's, there are a biological ways of producing it as well. Now, the, the complication is um, there was then a later finding that they had actually used the wrong frequency for phosphine. So I think that that was, there was probably a mistake. There was, it seemed to me like a good possibility it was a mistake and that there, there may have been some feature there, but they were matching it with the wrong frequency of the line. So I'm not sure what the, um, you know, what the current status of that is. But that did come out. It got people very excited. But there was some kind of error in the databases that were used to interpret the measurements. So that that was thrown. There was certainly a lot of doubt cast on that result. But I mean, in science, there was no there was no fraud. It's just mistakes happen in science. If you don't, if you don't, uh, if you're not making mistakes, you're not making progress. But in this case, that that one, like I say, did get um, did get that uncertainty thrown into it. 
Yeah, hi, thanks for your talk. I had a question. Uh, could you comment a little bit about the induced magnetosphere? Uh, the solar wind interacts with the ionization on the top layers of yep. Venus. And it sort of, is that why the atmosphere is still basically intact? Well, I can't answer that. I know that there's, uh, there is indeed, um, uh, there are induced um, um, induced magnetic fields. I'm sort of more familiar since I heard a talk recently on the same thing on Mars, because Mars doesn't have an overall magnetic field either. And yet there there is there is magnetism. And part of this is induced in the ionosphere of the planet and but mars has another thing is that there are magnetized rocks that produce a uh, produce it so i don't really i i really can't intelligently comment on what the effect of the induced magnetic field in the ionosphere of, of venus is if you want to hear about that let me make a recommendation you folks are in minneapolis i gather right correct okay at the university of minnesota there's a friend of mine he was here at uh Iowa for many years a research scientist. He's now a professor at Minnesota, Ali Soliman. And Ali is a space physics expert. And uh, you can tell him, Steve Spangler said to ask Ali to give you a talk on induced <laughs> induced magnetic fields at Venus. But that's that's not exactly what he uh, his specialty, but but uh, uh, he could probably he's probably more in touch with that than I am. But it's a very good question. I just don't have an answer to it. Okay, listen. Whoa, that's loud. Uh, and actually, we are having um, Ali as a speaker in a couple of months. So, oh, yeah, good, good choice. Good again. choice. Probably the rings of Saturn, or, but he's an excellent speaker. Perfect. We, I think we have one more in house. Uh, this is Matt. And I guess I'm just intrigued about the cloud patterns, kind of that Chevron look to the cloud patterns, even though it seems to have an exceedingly slow rotation. Is there something weird about that? I don't know that either. I'm trying to think about whether there's a thing called Hadley circulation that I think exists on, which is an upwelling in the equator and a flow to the poles. And I think that exists on Venus. Now, um, there also is, I know there are strong winds on the presence in the atmosphere of Venus, and I'm forgetting what the cause of that is. So I think these strong winds at altitude, which is the altitude is like 60 kilometers, a dense atmosphere and goes up to very uh, much higher altitudes than the Earth's atmosphere does. And I can't remember what the origin of the, the winds were uh, for those, but I'd imagine the, the features that you can see very faintly, if you go into the ultraviolet, they're clear, are associated with that, are probably a, a, an indicator of the high, high wind speeds in the high atmosphere of Venus. Perfect. I have one question about the probe. Do they have any estimate estimated time of how long it's going to last on the surface before it um, gets? Well, crushed? I think the main thing with this probe, I'd have to look and see what that again is. There, it's the mainly during the descent phase. I think that they think you just can't engineer things to last very long in that environment. But you know, if you could look up then on the NASA uh, website, uh, you know, with the Da Vinci, what the engineering time of how how they um, how long they think this is going to last. But I think what they're trying to mainly do is to have this sphere that you can see in this picture uh, la endure during the, the slow descent to the surface. And so it's going to be sampling the atmosphere, but then also imaging one of these tesserae regions as it comes down. But I don't remember that they, they were expecting it to last to make a lot of measurements on the surface. And I think that the reason for that is I think that's just too difficult to, to try and, and have those things survive. Okay, a uh, 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 guest here looked it up and it said it's about, they're lasting it to be in operation about 17 to 18 minutes under ideal conditions. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. That's not long. Not long, but it's like, okay, well. Well, maybe they can make something. I mean, you'd seem you'd want to be able to, you know, sort of make some kind of measurements while you were there. And that that's, my recollection is that's about how long these um, Soviet probes lasted when they got to the surface too. Okay. All right. I only have one curiosity question, which I think maybe somebody else is dying to ask as well. What came first, Da Vinci Plus or all of the words? Oh, <laughs> you mean because, well, I think what happens is 
these acronyms for spacecrafts are often kind of tortured. So I think somebody got a few few terms to get a deep atmospheric Venus investigation and then say, oh, that sounds like Da Vinci and put it together. That's So you can look at what the acronym says. And I think somebody was trying to be cute. That's uh, <laughs> <We're> just <laughs> press come in. Press what? Press that's more. What usually, that's the way it usually goes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, perfect. All right. Um, I, do we have any more questions in house or online? Well, thank you very much, Professor. We appreciate well, your time, and it's been very interesting. I. I learned a lot about Venus. Oh, and... well, yeah, go out and look at it. That's the thing. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And Ahmed, thank you for the invitation. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk to us via Zoom later this year on star names. Ooh, perfect. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, that. Okay. I... Have a great night, Stephen. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Well, goodbye. And only a couple of things for the people in-house. Um, hopefully you all know that you can bring your items to give, to donate, to swap out to the in-person in meeting. We look forward to having that again. So if you have stuff at home that you want to share, bring it on in. We'd love to see you here in person. And if you're here, please take a name badge if you don't have yours already. Or if you need to request one, go ahead and fill out the form and we'll get one made up for you and probably have it at the next meeting. All right, have, have a great